And it's, it's since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I became convinced that this story of forgiveness is very new. I became convinced that we in South Africa are the only country where the actual experience of forgiveness, not only forgiveness, the actual experience of perpetrators coming forward and feeling remorse and showing remorse. I have to say also that it's, it's not all perpetrators, actually it's very few perpetrators who showed signs of remorse. However, even the few who did show remorse, this was unique, a story that was unique enough to say something about it in the world. Until we had the Truth Commission in South Africa, what we knew about what's possible after these huge crimes, these crimes against humanity, what we knew about what's possible was based on the Holocaust and the uh, Nuremberg trials, you know, of the 19, late 1950s, 1960s. That's what we knew. And this was around um, prosecutorial justice. These perpetrators were called to justice, uh, uh, to be prosecuted. And in fact, what you know about it is that so many of them went to their gallows hailing Hitler, which is to say there was just no space for them to reflect on what they did. What's unique about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is that it forced perpetrators to reflect. That was a starting point. It was a critical starting point. Forcing people to reflect what you did was wrong. Look the victim in the eye and think about the pain you caused this person. That was unique. And without that, we would not be able to tell these stories now. And because this was not there during the Nazi trials, there was no moment of for these people to rediscover, or rather for the perpetrators there to rediscover their humanity. And for them, this was fine because Jewish people left Germany, they left Nazi Europe, they went to other places, they went to, to Israel, and we know what's happening there. We know the problems that are happening there, but let me just say that here in South Africa, precisely because we had to live with perpetrators, perpetrators, victims, bystanders, beneficiaries of apartheid in the same country, sometimes as neighbors. And so this, this, this alternative of facing one another and talking to one another was an imperative for us in South Africa because we encounter these people in the streets, sometimes they are neighbors, and then we're going to go to schools. Our children are going to go to schools, to school with their children. So this kind of conversation was very critical. It was a story to tell in the world, in the research, in many ways, get students to research it. It was an important, it was a unique story. It was a story that has, ne ne has never been heard before. That's the reason I was drawn to this story. And so my work started with Eugene de Kock, who is mentioned here, with interviewing him, because that story was the first one on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where we witnessed an actual forgiveness. And we asked ourselves the question, what does it mean? Someone kills your loved one and you forgive him? It had never been heard before. But just the fact that it happened called us to think again about what's possible, just this idea of what's possible. What we know, of course, today is that this does not resolve the problems of South Africa. But it is a story that remains important because it gestures in the direction of the possibility that we might actually talk to one another when we, are former en when we have been former enemies. And that in itself is a moment of hope, it does not resolve all our problems, but it is, it is enough. It is enough, and I use that word advisedly, it is enough as a story that can 
restore a sense of hope to say something is possible here. It's possible that humanity can be restored. There are other things, of course, as we know today, there are so many other things that need to happen for that story to actually triumph in the end. It should not remain that just a story of hope. It should be one that triumphs and a lot that needs to happen. And as we know, so much has not happened. But that story still stands as a valid story. Thank, thanks, Prof. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to pose a question? I have a question about forgiveness in general. If I, if I look at uh, forgiveness as a transaction, so somebody's giving and somebody's receiving, uh, I always question whether that is a transaction um, that is congruent, that a transaction where both benefit in the same way. I know in forgiveness, it's, forgiveness is a beautiful thing. But in this case, in the case of Stefan, for example, and in the context of South Africa, does the race context play a role to encourage the one to forgive in an inordinate manner? And there's almost an entitlement to receive the forgiveness on the other side. I happen to know uh, Greta Applegren uh, with Robert McBride, the Magoo Bombers. And I know how much she struggled. It still tortures me that she hasn't found forgiveness. And, and nobody is giving her a platform to ask for forgiveness. And she's become very self-destructive. Robert McBride seems to be going on with his life. But she's really struggling. So it just made me wonder, and I don't know if you have a particular comment on that. Um. I think that if we look at forgiveness as a transaction, we're missing the point about that process. Because once we introduce that language of transaction, then we necessarily have to look at it in terms of gains, benefits, and so on in, 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 in that context. However, if you look at forgiveness as a word actually as a wrong word, that it is the wrong word. What, what is important in that moment of encounter is really what unfolds, what emerges between two people, one who has hurt the other and one who has been a victim. Before I continue, I will say that, that of course you're right, some people take advantage and they're demanding forgiveness. I'm not talking about that forgiveness. And there are those situations where people demand. In fact, we heard it so many times at the Truth Commission, people saying, oh, you know, now is the time for reconciliation. Let's just forget and move on. We heard that many times from some perpetrators who were demanding to be forgiven. I'm not talking about those kinds. I'm talking about what I would call this true emergence of humanity when people coming from two sides encounter one another. One of the important moments that I, I think defines this process is that turning point where someone says, someone who has been hateful, has been angry, has a moment, you know, where they see something in the other person that says, you are like my son or you like my sister's daughter. I think that it's, an, it's a powerful learning moment for us just to learn that we can actually change. We often think that these people are prime evil, as we call Eugene de Kock, for instance, is prime evil is beyond redemption. In fact, there is that expression in, in, in the Bible when people say so-and-so is beyond redemption, which is to say, we exclude them completely from the possibility of ever being, of ever being redeemed, of ever redeeming themselves. They, they are just beyond the pale. 
And some people who are psychopaths are beyond the pale. However, there are people like you and me. When you think about these people who committed these crimes, they were truly like you and me. I often ask myself the question, what would I have done had I been white and apartheid? I don't know. And so there, by the grace of God, I was not born white. I am not confronted with these questions that, that now we confront white people. You ought to have done this. You ought to have done this. You ought to have resisted. I'm lucky, by the grace of God, that I was born by my parents who were black, not by parents who were white. So that realization is a point, I think, that actually unfolds when people encounter one another. They see the humanity in the, uh, in the other person. And they tell themselves, there by the grace of God go I. But in order for them to get to that point, the other has also to transcend something within themselves. So many of these perpetrators come with hate, you know, they were taught, they were told that black people are nothing, they are the scum of the earth, and so on and so forth. They, they are taught in their churches that you are the superior race, like this young man was saying. So they grow up with this. And so many of them continue to justify their deeds, but a few, like this young man, are able to look deep inside their conscience and recognize that what I did to you was something that was done to hurt another human being like me. And when that happens, and the victim or the family member of victim sees the true remorse, I think that both remorse and forgiveness are moments of change. And I think that's what really is the learning in all of this. It's not so much the word. In fact, in my work, I'm beginning to move away from this word. My fantasy is to write a book entitled Forgiveness is the wrong word. And it is the wrong word because it's not about the word. It's about, you know, what happens because it is something that happens, you know, at this moment where you come to face this man. Olga came, she rides this train or whatever she, 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 she travels in. She's filled with anger. She goes to the prison. She still feels it's filled with anger. This man comes and he talks and, and, and he opens up. And then something happens to Olga. He says, but this, you're just a boy, you're just a child. And so many people that I've talked to, it, that is the kind of thing that happens. You know, that happens. It's almost like you, 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 you bring that person into your world. And, but you can't be, bring a, an evil monster into your world. You bring someone who's like you. And in order for you to do that, you must see something that is like you in this other person. And, and, it, and the truthful remorse is, an enab is what enables the other to see that humanity in the other person. And for me, it's not you know, about transacting this relationship. It's about rebuilding you know, a humanness in this relationship, and that is what is important. The absence of that Capacity for empathy, capacity to connect to the other person as a fellow human being is the reason why we have so much anger and we're not able to connect. But when we embrace that capacity, when we, we at least recognize it and not deny it and encourage it, and it is encouraged also because of what you're getting back. Remember, this is... This is, a, this is a give and take. The give and take is not in the transactional sense, but it is in the, in the heart sense. It is in the heart sense, and that's where humanity lies. And then, you know, what emerges from that is something new. This is really what, for me, what is so important about these processes, these encounters, is that something new emerges. Something new, you know, comes into the place of this hatred you know, that, that uh, brought about, you know, the violence. Something new emerges, you know, this, what I call, it is the, the emergence of the unexpected. Because how can we expect that these kinds of words can come out of, of, a, of a place of pain and suffering and anger? How can we expect? You know, we cannot. So it, is, it, it emerges unexpectedly. Why? Because we see something in it, both of us. 
we see something. If I have caused you the pain, I see your pain. I see the pain I caused you. And it gives me pain. And remorse is like a punishment. Remorse is like a self-punishment. This is why many white people can't apologize or, or, or don't want to recognize that they benefited from apartheid. They're denying that, that, that truth. Because if they dare to accept and acknowledge the truth, it shatters their sense of identity. Because then, then, then the, the, the writing on the wall will be clear. You supported and maintained and benefited from a system that caused the pain that is written all over your body and your heart. And if I dare to, to see that, it shatters me you know, it shatters my, my sense of identity. And so the, the whole story of denial and these cycles of denial are because people are afraid, you know, of, of, of shattering the, their sense of identity. Mm -hmm. So these kinds of moments then, you know, suggest to us that it's okay to do that, it's okay to be vulnerable, and it's okay to allow that shattering. But you know what the irony is? The irony is, it is us, those who are wounded, it lies on us to, to, to create the openness and the space that, uh, within which this person, person can fall. Because they have to fall into a space where they feel they will not go into the abyss. Mm. So we, as the people who have the stories of suffering, are the one, I mean, this is the irony of this whole thing, that in a way we are responsible for, for the other person who has wounded us mm. by, by holding them. We provide that holding. Because if you don't, they fall into the abyss. If we, by our presence, we threaten them with that, with, that, with that falling into the abyss, then they are afraid. They protect themselves. They continue to deny. They don't want to face the shame and the guilt and so on. Mm. And so... That is what these processes mm. teach us, just the possibility of transformation, what's mm. possible in these encounters, in this transformation. It's not the be and, and all. So much more else needs to happen. But at the level of recognition of humanity, this is the important starting point. Mm. Prof, um, don't you think that there is a danger um, that Stefan's story as a sort of pop star perpetrator, if you like now, um, he receives awards and all of that, um, that there's a danger that his story is not generalizable to you and I in the ordinary sense, that you know, it, it doesn't take a bomb blast or a, a, a you know, shop right um, trauma to happen or, you know, so, so, so can we generalize the story to everybody? Last week, last Saturday, um, we are on Friday now. Last Saturday, we showed the film in Worcester. We called it the Worcester launch of the film to a large audience, uh, family members of victims, the community, all ages, racial groups. At the end, we had a, a panel conversation. And on the panel was a, a young woman whose father was killed in the bomb blast. And she said the following. I lost my father and I have nothing now. Here is Stefan's, he's being celebrated. I, I'm paraphrasing her words. He's being celebrated, the focus is on him. You know, what about us? You know, we lost, he's not, so she was really in a sense saying that this man is being celebrated now. He's the rock star, as, as you were saying. That is the challenge of these kinds of stories. It, it, that's exactly what happens. So our responsibility in te but e even having said so, it's an important story to tell because the stories mostly are stories about what happened to victims. It's important for us to see the other side too of how does change the people who have changed. I mean, he is addressing white folk I mean, he said somewhere that uh, a message to my fellow Afrikaners. So, and he's doing what's, what's missing in this discourse of reconciliation. He's doing it. He's acknowledging. He's saying, this is what is important. But you're right, you know, that 
the danger always is that then the focus is on, oh, you know, this is a great story. This man has confessed and so on. And then we forget about this young woman who at the end of the film says, you know, the focus is on him and we, are, we remain here. My mother is unemployed. I'm unemployed. You know, I'm about to have a baby. And, you know, she, she's expecting, and I mean, she doesn't say I'm a papa, but you can see that she's unemployed, her mother's unemployed. She's waiting for September, harvest. That's the only time, it's a seasonal jobs. And she's young. Her future could have been different. This man, you know, is celebrated. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the ambivalence and contradiction. Our story in South Africa, we, we have to hold all of it. You know, we have to hold all of these sides of stories, right? Uh, it, it is about, you know, our lives, our stories about, about contradiction. And, and the question is, what do we do about it? How do we, how do we move beyond the contradictions and, and all of these tensions? What do we do about, the, about it? What do, what do we do about it then is, 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 is a challenge to us. We need to take this you know, a step further. There is this story, we are meeting here, we are talking about this, we are reflecting on what it means, then what? So last week at this meeting, packed with all people from different walks of life, so one of us stands up and says, we are all here, we've watched, watched this film, we've listened to the people from Worcester, and, 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 and by the way, some of the stories were about how one of the stories told by the people who were on the panel was that Stefans has supported, has helped to start a, a, a community garden with people that he knows back in, 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 in Gauteng. They brought some equipment to start this garden, but the garden, the equipment is there, but the, the actual, you know, how to start it is not there. The seedlings, the seeds and, 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 and all sorts of other practical, you know, um, uh, 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 necessary uh, things that will get it going. So they need money to do it. So one of us stands up and says, well, we're all here. Those of you who are who, are, who have an earning capacity, you know, the person says, I'm challenging you. I'm putting down 500 rand. Better that or equal it towards the kitty for this garden, at least to have seeds to, for people to, to actually start. And some of the people in the room are business people. They're white people. You know, they're people who are professionals. And so that's the kind of thing. It's not, it's, it's small, but there's the kind of, these, are, these questions that you ask challenge us to say, well, we ask the question, but what about the action? That, that's the hope. The hope is that, you know, there is an action step, that we are all moved by these kinds of stories, but what is the action? Thanks, Professor. The first, uh, um, I think it was really important for me to come and see it again, because I watched it at the Labia the first time, and I was really challenged by it, because um, I was watching it, and all I saw was white exceptionalism. Um, it was the story of Stefan's, you know, I'm so wonderful, I've changed, you know, people have forgiven me. And um, my challenge was, what is the story of the people of Worcester? And I am really grateful that, you know, that now with the launch, the Worcester launch, you know, things are happening, because I wanted to know. So you have an annual table, you know, annual gathering. What is actually happening in the community of Worcester? Because we're talking... We, we are amazing when we talk about reconciliation in our country. You know, we like, I forgive you, and you know, yay, everything is fine. But what happens beyond that? What is the action? Um, f the conversation with the people that was um, from Vista that was there that evening was pretty much the same. The people went back the next day to go and clean up the blood, and they had to go back the, 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 the day after that to go and work. You know, how are, what are, what is being done by government, one, and also um, people in power, I would say, um, in Worcester to, to, to help the victims themselves, because basically the story is about Stefan's, and, and, and we're very grateful that there's a, a, another story 
you know, so it's not always like the black story being told or, you know, um, we, we're grateful that Stefan's story is also being told, but what about what is actually happening to help the victims? Yeah, that is the challenge, you know, that is the challenge and whether we look to government or we look to the community, that is the biggest question in our country. What is happening? Where is the action? One of the um, white uh, members of the audience, I think, is also involved in the leadership of the Worcester Hope and Reconciliation. After this, this woman whose story I shared with you a few moments ago, this young woman uh, spoke. He went up to her and, 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 and actually stood up in the audience and said, you know, we have to do something. When people tell these stories, we should not just say, oh, what is a sad story. We should do something. And he too said, um, I want, I am going to identify a psychologist to help this young woman because you could see the brokenness, you know. And so it's, it's, it's little, he's providing psychological care and, and he's gonna pay for it. He says, I will give at least 10 sessions with a psychologist, find one that's appropriate for your needs. But you write, again, that's not enough. And, 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 and also, if, if, if people decide we are going to give, you know, we're going to put this kitty in this box for the seedlings, you know, to be planted, you know, there'll be vegetables for people to eat something. For how long? You know, I mean, there's never, there will, it's, we need something, a, a real substantive injection of, of, a, of, of some imaginative uh, 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 intervention, like, you know, improve the school, make sure that every child goes to school, make sure that these young kids, I mean, this is the other thing when you go to a place like, you know, like Zuele Temba and all our township. I, I grew up in Langa. When I go back to Langa now, you can see poverty. When I grew up in Langa, you didn't see poverty. I mean, the, it was there, but it was not visible. It was there in the sense that people were not wealthy. People woke up, went to work, came back. All the kids, we all went to school. My primary school is still standing. So now you can see poverty is visible. This is why most people say it was better under apartheid. I mean, it's, it's, it's true, but it's not nuanced because we know that it was better under apartheid because the doors of urban areas were shut. People couldn't come to the urban areas. Now they're open. They're coming in their numbers because they're looking for work. And as a result, because there's no work, it is in our faces. It was hidden then, apartheid government hid it, all out in the homelands. And so now it's very visible and our government did not have, you know, the kind of imagination that would ensure that at least something shifts. They should have known that people are going to come into the urban areas in their numbers, but they were not prepared for it because they're not thinking about, they're not imaginative. You know, and even when they now see, they're so busy with other things, you know, about themselves and, 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 and not imaginative enough to think about what do, we, what do we do. So, you know, civil society in certain places is rising up on their own and are doing things and not waiting for the government. Sorry, we're going to ask people to come to the front. We're going to take two more questions, Prof, because they're recording, so you need to come up to us. Yeah, on the stage. <laughs> yes. Wally? Thank you, Rudy. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I have a lot of admiration for people like Olga um, in, in, in the film. Um, I think she's um, in a space where I will probably take a long, long time to be still. Um, I, I hear you talking about uh, Stefan says, says being given this rock star status. I don't have particularly have a problem with Stefanus getting this rock star status. What I do have a problem with is the fact that we're celebrating what is in South Africa the exception rather than the rule. Stefanus' story is the exception in South Africa. It's not, it's, it's not what, we, what we encounter in our daily lives. I have an issue with um, this whole concept of reconciliation. Um, we as black people are 
expected to reconcile with white people who clearly do not want to reconcile with us if we look at um, um, general life in South Africa. So I have an issue with that. And um, um, <clears throat> I, I, don't, I don't see how we should be celebrating what Stefans is doing if that is not representative of what is happening in Stefans' community. Thank you. Is it possible that, um, is it possible that um, the story of Stefans, I mean, so, so the choice might be, let's not tell the story of Stefans because it's an exception. But then um, we may well have not told the story of Nelson Mandela because that too is an exception. I mean, I am clearly not comparing the two, but I'm just think, suggesting, wondering, whether it is possible to use the exception to teach, is that something that we might consider, that possibility that an exception might be used to teach? Um, yes, we, we can do that, but if the exception is used to teach black people that you should forgive and that you should in fact also go onto your knees to forgive, then I have a problem with that. I also have a problem with that because uh, um, the, 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 the idea, I mean, the, for me, the, the two powerful stories from this film, one is that Stefans was forgiven at all. Actually, there are three stories. One is that we learn about this man, how he becomes uh, uh, this terrible boy at 17 who bombs. We learn about him. We learn about his, his history. And then, you know, the second one is that there is this opportunity for him to connect with the, with the families who have been wounded by his actions. The third one is the story that Stefans tells at the end, almost like speaking to the white folk, saying that this is what you should do. And, and there are all these stories and how we interpret the film, whether interpreted as a celebration of Stefans or we interpret it as, as a teaching moment, um, I think is, is a debatable point. I certainly, from my point of view, my hope is that, in fact, most of the audiences, you were at the Labia, um, the lady just left, uh, was at the Labia, we, our, and, and, and it was not just older folk, it was young people, young kids as well, majority white. And, and, and my hope is that the, the voice, this kind of voice, peop, it forces people to reflect. It forces white people to reflect, to say, wow, he's right. I mean, he's saying something very simple. He says, the woman who worked for you. I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily a revolutionary statement, but it's the kind of thing that we talk about when we talk about even the TRC, we say, the TRC, you know, missed the boat because, you know, it talked only about the gross violations of human rights, whereas, you know, apartheid, the humiliation that was caused by apartheid is huge, has left huge scars, and that is what was not addressed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, if these kinds of, I think, you know, uh, exceptionalism, it's a problem when we hoist it as, as, as a, you know, as a victory. Mm. But if we're presenting it in a way that challenges, then it, it, the potential to learn from it uh, is immeasurable. Mm. Because then it, it, it forces others to say, oh, that's possible. Mm. You know, it's an exception. Even under Nazi Germany, there are stories of very, very few people who are called the righteous. They're celebrated at all Nazi Holocaust centers across the world, those people who saved, even a person who saved one Jew, they're celebrated. They, you know, one Jewish family says, oh, so-and-so saved my mother, you know, and they hunt for this person that the mother talks about and they find the person. One Jew, they have a plaque at the Holocaust. Why? Because these people are a celebration of the human spirit the possibility that in spite of all this evil and so on, there were these voices of humanity and that that is possible and the challenges 
how do we expand these kinds of experiences so that it's not exceptional anymore. It's something that is possible because some people don't do it because they're closed. They don't know how to get there. Mm. But uh, with the possibility, they hear the stories of possibility, you know, they identify with them. Thank That's you. the hope anyway. Thanks, Prof. Thanks, Wally. I must be honest, I don't know what I want to ask. That's not, that's good. <laughs> yes, but I have a lot that's going on in my mind and as a normal um, South African. So I'm going to talk through what it is that's going on in my mind. My problem at the moment, I believe in forgiveness. Um, that's part of the values and principles that I have, that I live by. What I do think is, I think, South Africa is a, is a very uh, dangerous place and I want to go as far as saying I think white people continue to make South Africa a dangerous place and volatile. So I'll, I'll, I'll substantiate that statement. I tell myself every time not to watch Scott Blanche anymore. I tell myself not to listen to Cape Talk. I tell myself not to listen to 94.5. I travel quite a bit nationally, so I know all the other news media platforms that they own and so on. So it's owned all by the same company. And they spread exactly the same message. And sometimes on carte blanche here, they interview a guy from Cape Talk, and he sits there as an independent person. But if you are in the know and you have some intellectualness and you are a professional and you know, but this is all the same. And they keep on spreading this doubt about the uh, corruption and the failure of the New South Africa under the ANC. And that's not by coincidence. It's still the same as it was under apartheid. And they're playing with the lives of innocent people who do not necessarily know that. And that is where I have a problem. A very, very big problem. Why white people do this? I want to say I don't know. But I would be foolish if I said that. Because it is quite clear why they do it. So how do I explain to my child, because I don't want my child to believe the stuff that they put on TV and put in the paper and it's all the same owner. So how do we deal with that going, going forward? And a film like this certainly, almost in my mind, supports that line. So they look at us and they say, okay, so that guy, he thinks now he's sort of made it, you know, he's now, we've gotten him to the intellectual side, so he now thinks he's with us. And that is exactly where I want to draw the point. Because white people think it's only people like Julius Malema who disagree with them. And Jacob Zuma who went out at primary school level. I also disagree with them as a graduate. And I'm not saying you don't disagree with them, but we also need to communicate that to white people so that they know this. And uh, how we go about it, I don't know. And what I feel about Stefan's, I don't know. And at the same time, I just want to say I do believe in forgiveness. But I think white people continue to make South Africa a dangerous place to live in. They're creating uncertainty. And somewhere along the line, these conniving games that you play, will catch up with you. Thank but you, Charles. where are our voices as black people? I mean, we, we, are, um, we are a rising, uh, or, or South Africa has a, a, a rising number of uh, black intellectuals, for want of a better word. I don't like the notion of intellectuals, but people who are professionals are qualifying increasingly in, this, in these years. Why are we not inserting our voices in the public sphere? You know, why, uh, why are we allowing the voices that you're describing to dominate? Where are our voices? How do we insert our voices? We are, you know, we're in the majority now in most of these institutions. 
You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm asking a kind of, a, my question is sort of rhetorical in a way, but I'm also hoping that there might be answers. So I'll say this, like you, you know, I have not thought it through carefully, but it, I have wondered, you know, when I went to Free State, I left, I was at UCT. When I left UCT, UCT was more than 60% black students. There were a few staff, black staff members. I went to Bloemfontein. I was astounded. I walked into Bloemfontein. I hadn't been there since the 80s. And it's totally black. I mean, really, when I came in, I couldn't see. It took me time in the drive, of course, to see that, oh, there are white people. But it's complete, it's, it's really majority black. And I wonder about the verse is the same. And while it's important that, um, you know, we continue the, the, the sort of the discourse of oppression, you know, black people as oppressed, but the places where we are, you know, at the university, at these universities, we are a strong force. How do we change that discourse so that we are a force that really owns the space and says we are here? So that, you know, we are not always saying, you know, white people are saying this, white people are saying, which they are doing, but where is our voice? I really think that at some point we should challenge ourselves. How do we, how do we connect with one another so that, you know, we go through these difficulties. Nazima and I were at UCT, and Nazima and I had many conversations about these issues of race and, and challenges we face, but I think that there should come a time when we're asking the, ourselves, why are we still locked up in 2000, 2016? Why are we still engaging the discourse of oppression? When we really, we are professionals, you know, some of us are upcoming young people. Why are we, why is this, this discourse not changing at some point? And again, as I say, I'm, I'm not sure whether there are answers for it, but I think it's a question that we really need to confront. Why are we continuing with the discourse of oppression when so many of us are empowered in a range of ways? Well, I'm not going to profess that I know the answer, but what I just can tell you, it is very difficult. I can see why a guy like Robert Mugabe banned certain media in his, in his country, but the media is possibly your most powerful platform on which you can perform and proclaim whatever message it is that you want to drive. So if you are not in control of mainstream, what appears to be independent because it is not government owned, because it's private owned does not mean it is independent. You mean so, independent news is, is guilty of the same, no, I'm not, I'm not, same crime that I didn't, apartheid newspapers I didn't say, of. I said, no, I, said I said private is not independent. I didn't say all private. Yeah, I said private is not necessarily, in, the, the two things are not in, interchangeable. So, so media, that is the thing. And if you don't have access to it, uh, if you just think about the new age now, whatever is published in the new age, people just now sell it, say, it's on the other side. It's an ANC, uh, it's a government newspaper. And, and then, so, so what happens is, so you would have Cape Talk saying it, you'll have 702 saying it, you'll say 94.5 say it, and you will have Scott Blanc saying it, you will have, but that's all the same company. So how many people are really, it's the same person saying the same thing. I don't have to respond. No, I'm not going to respond. <laughs> <laughs> it's dangerous to let me respond. <laughs> In terms of time, danger, time. Yeah, I know. So you okay, can uh, take this last one, right? Yeah. Um, I'm from Ghana, so I guess my experience is different. But I, I was in South Africa from 1992, so I worked in the lead up to elections in 1994. And, you know, this is a powerful movie, and I'm taking my question on the issue of forgiveness. And I guess your statement, what next? I think after the 94 elections, I mean, and the lead up to it, I mean, we saw a lot of fighting, a lot of hate. And majority of the world thought that South Africa would not survive. So for me, the biggest thing was how South Africa came out of it and survived to the shock of the rest of the world. I mean, majority of the world, not everybody. And I lived here, so I was very, very happy. And everywhere I went, I trumpeted 
how, you know, one, this whole issue of forgiveness had brought South Africa out of what the Western media at that time used to call the bloodbath. They were expecting the bloodbath in 94. But then somewhere in December 94, I had gone back to Ghana for Christmas. And I met a South African general, Afrikaans. And he came to visit Ghana for the first time. That was his first time in the rest of outside South Africa. And I happened to be at his dinner party for him. And I asked him that. Obviously, everybody around the table was happy and were hailing him. But he wasn't a happy person. So I asked him that you should be very happy. You are a South African general. You are, you are part of the story. And what has surprised you about this whole transition? And his answer surprised me. He said, his, the black man's or the black person's propensity, that was the word, propensity to forgive. That after April, the elections, everybody moved on like nothing happened. And for me, as a South African, as a former general in the army, it bothers me. And I said, why does it bother you? He said, because he believes that people should be punished for bad deeds. And I said, but there's your people who are going to be punished. He said, yes, so that the next generation will not do the same thing. And I said, but there will never be another apartheid. He said, but look at your country. Look at the rest of Africa. It's not going to be the Africana or the white person against the black tomorrow. It's going to be the black against the black in the sense that they know they'll get away with it. And I'm just sharing this because I don't have the answers. But as I travel around the continent, and I do a lot of traveling, you know, you see our leaders, and they do stuff, and they know they'll get away with it because we forgive. The next leader comes, and we forgive. So the same, you go around the world, and Africa is the most underdeveloped continent with the most resources. Today, when I was picked up by Eugene from the airport, and he was telling me about the UK, I said, by 6 p.m. today, David Cameron will be gone. You know, I said, by 6 p.m. today, he'll be gone because he supported the cause. It didn't work. Whether the vote was right or wrong is not the issue. If it had been in Africa, he would still be clinging on to power. So for me, the issue that the professor raised about this whole issue of forgiveness, it's nice, the humanity, but does it really develop us? And every time I travel around the continent, I mean, the general is dead now. But today, if he was living, I'm sure he would be saying that you guys thought I was wrong, because if you look at what is happening in South Africa, there's economic form of, um, I don't want to use the word apartheid, but stupidity in Africa, where you look at our leaders just doing things because they know they'll get away with it. But the reason why we're still stuck in this quagmire is because the people, our people are not developing. You have a few people who are taking all the wealth, and the rest of the people are there. And South Africa, unfortunately, is also going through that path. And for me, this issue of forgiveness and things, if you look at films like this, when Safan and others are healed, in another context also makes the people who are stealing our money, the people who are not building our institutions, because they know they'll get away with it. And I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, or the general was right, but then it's, it's bothersome, and I guess, when the professor asked a question about forgiveness, at what point do we say that people have to be responsible and people have to be punished for their wrong deeds so that the next generation does not continue on that path? Yeah. Uh, Prof, I, I'm going to let you conclude with in response to Edward, um, and then also to, to say that, of course, your movie is a snapshot, isn't it, of a particular story and that's not necessarily everybody's story. Yeah, and, and it's just, a, I mean, it's an important story to tell. Um, you know, people often ask the question, um, was South Africa right to take the path of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? And the question that I ask back is, would prosecutorial justice have yielded better results? Now, if you think about Germany and the prosecutorial justice there, the Nazi crimes, and you look at 
what the victims of that Holocaust are doing today in Israel, then it leaves us with the question, is it necessarily, you know, is, is, does that lead to a, 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 a new kind of approach? Here in South Africa, we had uh, the Anglo-Boer War. The Afrikaners who suffered, whose graves cover the free state are the ones who perpetrate what's going on in South Africa. So one is to think about the complexity of this whole history instead of simply blaming the way that we dealt with apartheid in South Africa. And we should also avoid this kind of blindness of focusing on one thing, one phase of our history and blame that phase of our history. If you look at 94, and, and, and I'm saying this both you know, as in observation and also based on, on studies that have been done. There have been studies that look at the whole violence trajectory in our country, it, the developmental, you know, how it has developed. It's very clear that there were, there were five years in South Africa where there was relative calm, both in terms of you know, the level of crime and the level of service delivery protests from 2000, things started changing, and then they have become worse now. Now, when we talk about worse, the worse, if we want to date the worse, it takes us back to Pulugwane. And I'm not saying this because I support white voices or anything. I'm not uh, an apologist for white people. In fact, I have spoken very strongly about the white people's difficulty in acknowledging their benefits from apartheid. However, I have a responsibility as a black person to say that there's something wrong with our black government. There is something very wrong. A few years, and I'm, and I'm going to say this, I maybe spend half a minute saying this, because I know we're running out of time. But really, if you, if you think about, people say, for instance, what is the expression with the fish rots from the head? Is there, am I saying it right? If you think about, if you look at what has happened since Pulugwane, starting with the whole corruption trials of the president, and how these corruption trials were handled with people, for instance, school teachers, leaving children writing at school, taking buses and saying on radio, I remember this vividly. I stopped my car, I could not believe it. A teacher of the union said, it's either you change the date for the exam or those kids will have no one to invigilate. We are going on the bus to support Jacob Zuma in Peter Marisbeck. And this is exactly what happened. Up until then, as, as far as my memory tells me, we had not had these huge problems of teachers, you know, banking out and so on. But since that period, there was just a massive, you know, total absence of ethical morality when it comes to these issues. And, and these are important issues to realize, to remember. I mean, if a president listens to Malima and says, I'm going to kill for Zuma, and doesn't say, no, you can't say that. And then this is where we are now. We have to say these things. And it's not because we love white people. It's because we love our government. And we, we, we want to be truthful about what are the factors that have contributed to where we are? That chaos, that absence of principle, that total absence of principle, because if we have principle, you can say this is what we do when we are responsible leaders. And if you're not acting responsibly because you want to avoid going to court, you want to get everybody to support you, you want to um, to get people to come to court and dance and, 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 and say all sorts of things in order to, to, to feel that you are supported by your people. And then when something like this happens in our country, you say that, you know, this country is rotten. How about thinking about where did the rot start? So what I'm trying to say is there is a lot that we can say about our response to apartheid. But we also have to think about, if we had had prosecutions, first of all, would we be sitting here? Who had the power at the time 
The army, the South African Defense Force had the army. They could have done, I mean, I don't want, I, probably Zaneria is the only best person to debate on this. But as I am a citizen, I know that if we had gone to, the, this was the issue. What are you going to do with these people? And so, you know, a response of this kind is not perfect. And if, if you think about what happens in countries like Rwanda, for instance, where people have gone to prison, thousands of prison, people in prisons, and Rwanda realizing that this is not helping us. Let's release some of these people. Let's find a way of releasing and creating another mechanism where people can connect because the neighbors killed other neighbors. And already in Rwanda, the children of the perpetrators are saying, you are responsible for my father being in prison. And so the cycle of hatred runs its course across generations. The question is, how do you break that cycle? Can we find, is there a perfect way of breaking the cycle? The answer is no. So all of these are approximations of attempts to become human again in a country that is ravaged by this, by this past. And some of this responsibility is on our current leaders who are corrupt. We have to say this. Whether you know, we say it along with, with white newspapers, we have to say it. They are corrupt. They are not helping to build a morality that will teach people what the right thing is, that, that it's good to be right. What is teaching now is that it's good to be corrupt. Actually, I want an easy way, you know, and I know what an easy way is. I don't have to go all of this trouble. I just shoot you because then I can be mayor if you are dead. I mean, it's a culture, isn't it? It is a culture. And do we put this on the door of the Truth Commission? Absolutely not. The commission can be blamed for other things. But these kinds of things that are happening in our country, in my view, have little to do, less to do with what we did after the Truth Commission and more to do with how the leadership in this country has exercised its power. It has been actually about power not so much about leadership. And I think we should teach our children at these places to, to be critical, you know, to be critical, to think reflectively about what, what, how, can I, how can I do things that are based on principle so that our children and adults too, that when, when, when things fly, they, they hit the fan, we have in the final analysis principle to stand on. There isn't any of that. We need, that's what we need to teach, not so much forgiveness. This story is, for me, it's about teaching the possibility of how we can reclaim our sense of humanity. And how can we teach our children that? But along with teaching them, how do we create opportunities for challenging those in power so that the lives of others can change too? Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's, um, we started off the conversation by saying we're thinking about the critical space, and it's interesting, Prof, how when we just talk about forgiveness, how quickly we stumble on the notion of politics. And when we talk about a story of a white man, how quickly we stumble on the, the corruption of the black person. Uh, when we talk about your own experiences and others, and Wally saying, I'm not ready, uh, how Stefan's story is not Wally's story. And so I wonder, in all of this complexity that you talk about, uh, as we leave here and have a cup of coffee, of course, um, and your after party, uh, I wonder, Prof, you know, um, two minutes just for you, uh, you know, whether it's all worth it at the end, uh, whether uh, Claudia's suggestion, yeah, about uh, forget the TRC, you know, let's go straight for the uh, deferred revolution, if you like, whether or not that wouldn't have been a better option. And I wonder about that. I think we should think about a different kind of revolution. A different kind of revolution, one that restores our sense of humanity. 
And, and by that, I don't necessarily mean softness, but I certainly mean that revolution is a different kind of violence. I mean, if, if we speak out in strong ways, it is a violence, a violence that does not mean throwing a bomb in this building and setting a light. A violence that says, we are in power now. We come to this institution and we create you know, photographers like Mikhail who are going to go out in the world and, and, and tell a different stories from the stories that are told in these newspapers that we are all worried about in these radio stations. It's Mikhail. It's all the young people who are drawing, painting art. I mean, I walk in here, there's a beautiful woman who is clearly in pain, that face. I mean, that in itself is a story of a black woman in pain. What are we saying about that? These are artists. We're producing power in this house. Let's not, it's, that's a violence. For me, that we, we need to, to decolonize the notion that revolution means violence. We need a different kind of violence. We appreciate the evening. Thank you, Prof. One more round of applause, applause for her.